did the painting in 2004, 2005. I, I went from color pencils, pastels, watercolor, and I just naturally found my way to oil by mistake. And, <laughs> and then I hooked up with a group called the All Weather Gang and the Genesee Valley Planner Painters. And at that time I was pastel painting. And I was taking lessons from Catherine Bevier, who I'm sure we all know. My, you know, she just is a fantastic teacher. And uh, you know, one of the so one of the uh, lessons that I got from her, um, I'm finely detailed. I I try not to paint that way now, but I used to paint that way or try to paint that way. And so the trouble we have when we're painting in general is we're going to try to get too detailed on here before we get big general shapes in. So she came up to me one time while I was painting and she said, you know, Kevin, we we're painting in Rochester and we we're painting uh, at that, not city of Rochester, but I think it might have been the alpaca farm. And so I'm painting whatever, something really detailed, but I don't have the whole thing painted. And she said, Kevin, first you have to let everybody know we're in the United States. And then you have to let everybody know, you know, we're in Monroe County. And then you let them know you're in Rochester. And then you let them know that the specific spot where you were. And what she meant by that was, um, you need to get the big shapes in first, generally, and then work from there. Now, that's what I do. I try to do. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's really not an axiom because everybody has different ways to paint. I'm going to show you the way that I've learned how to do it through study, through uh, taking workshops from people that I, I love their work. That's my criteria when I sign up for a workshop. I see their work. I check them out. If there's a short video or something I could see their method, I look for that. And then I decide, was this, you know, is it worth to spend the money? So now if anybody has any questions while I'm talking, go ahead and ask. Um, you know, I, I could usually, I, like I said, I talk a lot and, uh, I've been blessed with the ability to paint and talk at the same time. And typically it's because what I'm doing is I'm telling you exactly what I'm thinking while I'm painting. So somehow my silly brain has them connected up there. So that might be a deficit in other areas, but it sure does work when I'm painting and, and demonstrating. So now I'm getting chillier. So anyways, plein air painting. I'm going to go plein air paint. Um, you know, I sometimes don't even know where I'm going. But what I can do is check what the weather's going to be. You know, do I need to wear a lot of layers? Now, I was here Thursday, and I thought it was going to be warm. I am not a rookie. I've painted close to a 1,000 times outside. 500 at least. I don't know. I haven't counted. So I'm here. I've got my winter coat. I don't have this. I have my gloves, but I wasn't wearing long johns. And I was okay for about an hour, and then I froze. So I hope everybody's got warm enough clothes on. Uh, just being idle, because this truly is a sedate activity. I mean, I back up often when I'm getting too uh, uh, like bogged up. I'll walk away. If I'm painting with people, I'll go see what they're doing just to get away for a minute so that I could come back with some fresh eyes. So I did check the weather, and I knew it was going to be like this. So my main goal here is to, like, help somebody. All of you I'd love in one way or another. So I, I try to base my demonstrations on how can I be helpful, um, and, uh, you know, how can I be human while I'm doing this? I, I don't want to... Paint a painting that I did 20 times already and show you how to plan or paint because the truth is when I go out every time, I don't know what I'm going to paint and I don't know what kind of, uh, you know, what I'm going to encounter. Uh, so I'll be right back. <laughs> An example. You are watching um, a demonstration yeah. in oil plein air by pot. Kevin. <laughs> So the last day, I always try to pay attention to the weather. The last day I painted down south, um, I was at the mercy of who was taking me around. So I went where they went. And 
the last day he selected a spot where there was really no shade to paint and it was 90. so i have to decide do i want to stand in the heat do i want to lather up with um you know with sunblock i try to avoid that if i can and uh and i always look for shade so I, I did this painting, it was early in the morning, I didn't want to stand in the sun, so I found a spot that was kind of in the shade, similar composition, but not the same, and I thought I could make it up, and so I, I come up with this, but I fully did not intend to stack these two things, and I did. I stacked them. I didn't want to stack them, but I did. So, you know, and it's so my scene was way over there. I'm behind a tree, and I would go like this, <laughs> go back and paint. And then the truth is, is this light only lasted for three minutes. And nearly this whole painting I painted without even looking over there. You know, I got the main shapes in. But the, the point I'm trying to make is so I got there and I had to choose do I want to paint or not? Can I find something interesting that's, you know, not out there in the water with the boats and everything? And truth is, I couldn't because, I mean, I could, but I had already painted a bunch of that type of stuff. So in front of painting, you've got to be adaptable. You have a plan and then be adaptable. So I did put, I did lather up anyways, because I didn't want to, you know, be sunburned really well. And uh, I painted as fast as I could. And I had enough information I could just leave there and then do a little bit back in the studio. So anyways, I try not to wear a shirt like this. Because when you're wearing a shirt like this and you point to your painting to paint, the light reflects on it, gets on your painting, and then it's hard to judge the depth of your values. It's hard to judge color sometimes. Or you get a silly reflection. Um... Sometimes I'll use a glass palette, same thing happens. Uh, sometimes the ferrules will catch the light while I'm trying to do a spot. So, um, you know, I, I try to pay attention to those kinds of things. But uh, I usually try to wear darker, grayer clothes. I don't always do it, it's not always an option. I have, you know, many coats I wear. So this is my winter painting coat, it's ready. I know, am I in that? <laughs> so, so this is kind of ready. It's my painting coat. I know I'm being videoed, but I want to be authentic. I'm not here for a dog and pony show. I'm here to show you what I've learned. So, you know, sometimes I wear this. I, this is my uh, Indiana Jones hat. I love this hat. You know, and this is really warm. The ears flap down, and then I could do this for shade. So I wear this a lot in the winter. When I know it's going to be windy, and I usually will bring both of these during the summer, when I know it's going to be windy, I wear this one because this one here doesn't pull up as tight, and this one will go right tight so the wind doesn't blow it off. Because the wind um, is, you know, one of the biggest problems for me with plein air painting is it's really super windy. All right, so I also have a shade buddy. And this is just an umbrella. It's, sometimes it's to keep the sun off of me. Like in Florida, I didn't have it. And uh, so I might have been able to paint in the sun if I had all of my tools. I didn't have all my tools down there. But when I was here painting uh, this, this week, I used it to keep the sun off my palette. So I was in this general area, but the sun was on my palette. And when I mix colors, and I believe it's the same for everybody, when I mix colors in the sun and I put the color in the shade, there is no, it just looks completely different every single time. Now, even when I do shade it and mix the color down there, oftentimes it'll look a little different up there. And then I adjust it some. There's uh, multiple ways to adjust. We'll get into that when I'm uh, throwing some paint down. So the, okay. <laughs> So you're good. comfort. You know, you want to be comfortable when you're painting. I found that if I'm uncomfortable, it's a distraction. So comfort could be mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, there was a time where a friend of mine was standing on a hill to get the perfect view. So he was like this, and his calves were burning. You know, and so I've done it where I was kind of like this or kind of like that. I painted one time where I 
thought it was high tide going out. It was low tide coming in. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I was in the water. I mean, I was definitely getting wet. So, any questions on any of that? The weather, what we're going to wear. If I'm going in the woods, I have bug spray. Once again, I try not to use those things, but if I have to have them, I have them. Um, now, whether or not whether or not the sun's a problem or not in the summer, okay, let me back up. I wear this to shade my vision so that when I'm looking out there, I don't have the light. Even without the sun, it's pretty bright right there, and it'll, like, it'll affect what I'm seeing, so this helps. But even if I don't need that, if I'm enclosed somewhere, it keeps the bugs off your head. And it, it really does. It, it works. So, you know, I, I use that for that. It's good to have a light setup when you're painting. Now, Drew has all kinds of setups over there. And we're allowed to go check them out, open, close. He'll tell you all about it. He knows a hundred times more about that than me. So I'm not going to get into that kind of thing so much. This just so happens to be a setup that Dick Westfall made. I love it. Um, there's a lot of things I like about it. Um, I like the way that I can take, so I can take this panel and I can get it at any height I want once I figure out how it works. <laughs> you know, that type of thing. And I can also turn it when the sun's coming on me. Um, you know, I like the fact that I can have my brushes there, have my tools ready at hand. Okay, so I think it's really important that when I go paint somewhere, I try to stay on the side of the road. I try to respect posted signs. I have a friend that will ask people often, knock on their door. I'm not as gutsy as that. If I have to, when I'm teaching workshops, I'll do it, but I, I'm uncomfortable with it. But if they give us permission, then we will go on their property. But I find oftentimes the best views are from the side of the road. Um, you know, a great painter, Charles Mavelli, he's said you try to paint the glance. You know, when you're driving by and see a glance, and you're like, oh, my God, i got to paint that. Now, I saw about 50 of them on my way here, and I'm not kidding you. I'm like, oh, my God, no, the sun's not shining. Yes, it's overcast. Most people think, no, it's not going to be a good painting day. But I'm seeing this over here. That Most of it had to do with there was a really brightness in it, um, which would be the sky in this case, sky or water in that case. I saw, like, middle values, and I saw some really darks, and they were all just glances. What I found is I'll see a glance sometimes, and I'll stop back, try to find what I saw, and I can't find it anymore. So the trick for me is to, how am I going to paint that glance? Because something about it said, you know, that's dynamic. So I'm always looking for, for a, a dynamic uh, composition, um, dynamic value shifts, really high chroma color, which is rich color. Uh, what can I get away with? Sometimes I go way too far, and sometimes I don't go far enough. Now, here's another thing that happens to me often in plein air painting, and I might have to make a mad dash. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> oh, my gosh, she followed me. <laughs> you don't worry. I got gotcha. you. When I... When I run away, pin them maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a good idea. So, I'm painting this outside, and I got it back inside, and I just realized that because it would, okay, let me back up. All colors in the outside light really show their true color. You put it in the sun, it really brightens it up, but in, especially in this kind of light, you know, you can see true color. Now, you take that into your house, and if you've got a yellow light, you know, 2,700 Kelvin, 3,600, or 65, you know, that's a range between yellow and blue. And that'll make your colors look different. So when I, or because there's not as much light in there. So when I got this back to the studio, I realized some spots were just too dark. And I didn't get the punch. My concept for this one was... You know, the light was streaking through. You know, I wanted to show that bright field, but I wanted that dappled light in there. That's what I wanted to do. When I got it back in the studio, I was like, I thought I was nailing it out there. I really did. And I got it back in the studio, and I was like, meh. So I worked it a little bit. Now, 
how much, not really a lot, but I just put some lighter green right in there. I made a couple darker darts in there and I spiced up the light just a little bit. That's all I did. And, uh, and I think I helped it. So here's another one. I just had the idea. I, I was seeing this, this color everywhere. When I went to paint this scene, it was essentially the cabbage pine, whole lot of yellow, whole lot of green. And that's really all that was there. Um, I, there. I think there is a picture of it on my Facebook. But I decided I'm going to see what I can get away with in color. And I just went for it. And uh, I'm happy with the results. Okay. I have a box of all kinds of things in here. You know, you never know when you're going to need a clamp. Um, I got bug spray, um, sunblock. I've got some players. I've got a flashlight. I don't really, uh, I've got a name tag. So where's Barbara? So I, oftentimes I forget my name tags. And so I decided I better put a name tag everywhere in case I forget. And, and this, and this is my most important tool when I'm starting is the viewfinder. So this and this last night I put in my boot because <laughs> I knew there was no way I'm going to forget it in my boots unless I forget my boots. There was a time I was wearing all of my gear. I had this on, I had this hat on, I had that coat on. I truly looked homeless. I was painting just down the way from him just a little bit. And I had somebody stop in a kind, generous way, ask me what I was doing, told her what I was doing, talked a little bit. And I explained I'm with a group and we just had breakfast. And uh, she goes, here, oh, no. it was money. And I said, oh, no, that's not necessary. It's really not necessary. Oh, please. I'm like, oh, I'm good. And she says, well, you know, I stopped here just to give this to you. So I, I took it. You know, I just put it in my pocket. So uh, I, she truly thought I was homeless, I think. <laughs> you know? So, uh, she didn't notice the expensive paint there. setup. <laughs> she, yeah. She, yeah. But she had no idea how much cobalt teal costs. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a color I really love, and it is not cheap. So, uh, so when I'm out there, the main thing is comfort, not really what I'm looking for. Okay, so the number one question I get is, look at all of this. Like even if you look over there, there's a bench up there. If the sun was hitting it, that might help. There's trees behind it. You, you know, you've got this undulating type hill and you have these beautiful cloud formations. So I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm thinking about composition, how I can lay it out on my panel and, you know, is it interesting enough to me to want to put three to five hours, literally? I mean, really, sometimes i that's how long I'll paint for a little guy like this. And this is four hours of the scene that is right here behind us. So I got a picture of this um, that I'll probably post a little bit later where it kind of blends right into the painting back there. Except for, you know, this has late morning light and when I took the photo it was like 4:30. I started painting around noon and I couldn't take the cold anymore and I you know and I well I was done besides. So you know this painting is tree there, this tree here, the water, the distance. Chose to go with purple. The sun was shining. It wasn't purple over there. But uh, it's a receding color. So that was my personal choice. Um, to, to use that. So what I thought might be a pretty good lesson too, I want to show you some of my techniques, but to show you that when I look over there, you know, I'm trying to decide what am I going to paint? What am I going to demonstrate? Am I going to do that? I could look down here. This thing's nice. I paint standard sizes, 6'8", 8'8", 12'16", 8'. 18 or 816, uh, those types of formats, and I can get any size I want, you know, just by doing that. And I'll frame it up, you know, I'll look is that better in a square or is it better like that? 
And I call this my hemming and hawing stage. And I stall. I do this in portrait painting too. I stall. It's my stall tactic. But I'm not, I'm not wasting my time. I'm considering everything that's out there. I'm thinking about how am I going to do it. I want to paint an easy painting. It's not easy. It is not easy. But I want to paint an easy painting. Sometimes they come out like that. But almost always I'm battling it. And I love it when somebody says, how relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> you know when it's relaxing? Sunday morning, I got my cup of coffee. I've got a finished painting, and I'm fussing with an edge. I've got a color that got dirty, so now I'm going to take clean color and spot it over top of it. That's relaxing. That's fun to me. The satisfaction of putting forth all kinds of physical and mental energy to come out with a painting that, you know, somebody might even want to buy is just truly rewarding for me. So, um, yeah, so we're going to figure out what are we going to paint. And when I was here on Thursday, I believe, I just, when I saw that even walking down the hill, I knew I'm doing something with that. But also, I might be being too loud. I don't think so. No. Well, also, I love that tree over there. Like that. So I look for these contrasts I talked about. You got a dark value, a medium value, and a light value. So let's consider the tree over here. Okay, there is the thing. So the, the trunk of that tree is really dark. So there's my dark value. And everything behind it, let's say the grass is my next value. Everything behind it is a little darker than the grass. And then the sky up there is the lightest. So for me to make a painting that I think will look nice, that I'll be happy with, that's worth my effort, it's got at least three major value shifts. And I also will try to keep them all together, but as you see with what I did on, um, on Thursday it was, so that looks really complex. It, to me, it does anyways. You know, I, I have foreground, and then there are the reeds, there's water, distant hill. But for me, one of the hardest things to, to achieve is when you have these trees like that, where the buds are just sprouting, it's wispy, you can see through it. I can't get away with a solid mass of green like you can in the summer. So I want to try to express that in the simplest way without, without going and saying dot, 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 dot. When I do that, I lose all natural effect. So, you know, I'm going to try to show you, you know, how I can do that. Okay. Any questions? Well, what are you painting? Are you painting that tree or that scene? Or you haven't decided yet? I really haven't decided. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, okay, one minute. So I'm not going to do a finished painting. I'm just not going to have enough time. So I'm going to show you some of my uh, techniques, okay. but I'm going to pick a scene and use that Got it. Okay. as my bones for it. Okay. Yes? What, what is the surface? What is your... Ah. I was just telling a friend of mine, I don't have an outline. I've been mulling this over for a while because I want to keep it fresh. I don't want to try to follow an outline, but that is a great question because that's one of the things I was going to talk about. So I make these, I love them. It's muslin glued on masonite and it's gessoed with two coats of acrylic gesso. I've tried oil-based gesso. I've tried uh, oil or lead-based um, grounds where nothing absorbs in, but for my style of painting, um, I love the surface. The paint sinks in a little bit, especially my first layers. When I layer, I try to layer thin. Sometimes it's a wash where what I do is I mix up my color. I add some Gamsol or a medium. I typically just use Gamsol and I thin it up and then I scrub it on there. Sometimes I just use the paint, but still a small amount and I scrub it on there. And uh, so it's still thin paint, only one of them's been uh, uh, cut down with the Gamsol. you got to be careful to not do too much of that because it hurts the integrity of the paint. Now for me, 
I'm putting on such a thin layer that I haven't had a problem yet. So I'm, I don't know, I'm not a conservator. I, I'm 100% on all that, but it's been working for, you know, 15 years or, well, let's say 10. What don't you like about the uh, oil-based primer? Well, I might like it. But it's a pain in the neck and it's got to dry and you get a clean brush. You no, know, I'm always experimenting. I started with this. I saw somebody using the oil base. I loved their, their you know, the, what they were achieving. So when I made a batch, I did all oil based panels. And I used it. And then I realized it was too slick. I was having a hard time with it, didn't sink in for me. So now there's other things I could do to solve that. I could add a dryer to my paint. Um, I could use straight turpentine outside, which is caustic. You're outside, but the turpentine dries perhaps three times quicker if I put a little bit in with paint. <coughs> my first layer is I try not to use uh, white in them too because usually when I add the white then I can't do some of the effects like I try to do. So, uh, and I make batches of these at a time. I still love to do it. I guess when I don't love doing it anymore, I won't. I use authentic rabbit skin glue. I buy all my stuff from Rochester Art Supply. I love going to that store. I don't ever buy stuff online because I want to go there. I want to walk around. I want to see my friends. I do. And uh, I always buy more than I went there for. It's like a kid in a candy store. Uh, yeah. And I almost uh, never walk out of there with brushes and I need brushes. You're going to be down. But anyways, I use authentic, rabbit, well, it's called rabbit skin glue, but it's probably just animal glue. Who knows what the animal is? Yeah, so I make a weekend of it, you know, when I'm actually making them. That's a whole nother story. If anybody wants to know about that, I could email you that. So we, I, I don't want to go too much more into that. What's the another... largest size you can make without it warping? Ooh, they all work. Okay. It's how much you're comfortable <laughs> with. I, yeah, I tried, uh, you know, backing some big ones. And it turned out that my, the boards that I used to cradle it, they work a little bit. Can you also finish the back side to, or no, So I've tried that. I've, I've tried using um, B-board, I think it's called, where you, you use it when you remodel a bathroom. It's got a Formica-type finish on the front, and the back of it is the masonite. So I was gluing to the masonite, and I had that sealed back. It still worked. So I've, I've learned that I don't, I, I am... I'm very anal retentive. I there's certain details. There's just certain things that I need to do, like rinse something out three times. That's just me. And so you know, when I'm going to make these panels, I just you know, I, I just I'm set in my way and how I have to do it. So, okay, any any other questions on that? Do you ever tone the canvas before you start? I used to tone the canvas, and so I, I'm going to demonstrate because that's part of what I talk about. I like to paint on white now. I've tried orange canvases. I've tried gray canvases. When a instructor and I'm in their workshop and they want my panel toned, I go there with it toned. I will not go and buy, you know, $400 worth of materials if I don't have them. I'll try to get by or maybe buy the key thing that I think I need, but I don't want to go buy a whole bunch of stuff unless uh, I know I'm going to use it. So when an instructor says bring in a certain tone panel, I'll, I'll do it for that. But And I've done it for myself before. But what I find is I'm going to cover this white. And I'm going to cover it with whatever I want to be underneath what's there to help me paint a fresh painting without belaboring it. Did I talk about all my materials? Probably not, but... What brushes do you use? I'm pretty warm, so I'm not too worried about that. I use Robert Simmons. I like flats, but this is gone now. The, the uh, It's a filbert. And <laughs> it was a flat that turned into a It was a flat. So this is what they look like when I buy them. Clearly, I don't paint big paintings, because I've had this for three, four years. And, uh, but I do paint medium sized ones. And so I, you know, I'll use these. I usually will not go into a panel like this with this to begin with. Unless I really feel like, even when I'm doing portraits, I don't do that. 
unless I really feel like my subject is needs to be so accurately drawn that I, I've got to put some marks in with this. But then two, if that's the case, I'll use a pencil because I have more control. Um, I want there to be nervous control in my brush strokes. You know what I mean? This nervous control. So I want to be able to say, yeah, I want a mark there. I want the color. I want to get it all mixed just right. I want to put it down, but I, I want to like put it on in a way like, like that, you know, instead of, you know, licking the surface. And then you continue to do that. And before you know it, mud, mud, mud. So, you know, I like to be able to get the brush strokes like that. And when I mix up some paint, you know, I might do that. Or if I'm doing a wash, then there's no nervousness. It's just, and then I'll wash stuff around. Giving other people to dominate the airway. So, I love the liner rigor. Use that. Uh, portrait painting that's kind of still on hold but there was one day drew baker paints with us there I'm telling you he is so knowledgeable about stuff but one day i'm painting and he comes along and drops these well like these light onto my palette he goes give these a try you <laughs> know so i did and i loved them you know so i gave him well i think i kept them for a little bit used them at some point i gave them back it might have been that same day i don't remember but I went and bought a bunch of them. And uh, so these are, this is a Fennec bristle. And these are not authentic bristle. They're uh, bristle-like. They're not a soft sable-like. So they have that roughness. And you can, you can leave, uh, you know, those nervous marks. But it seems to be when you do a brush stroke like that, it gives you a... a a melted edge into a color instead of a hard line. Or if I need a hard line, I'll get it wet, this turns razor sharp, and then I could do that kind of thing. Or, you know, say I want, well, I'll give you a Kevin, what are they? Prince and Aspen. <laughs> Before you tell us more, what are they? Princeton Aspen. So when I was first starting on here, I wanted there to be a hard edge here. I had, I really thought about this composition. Where do I want the eyes to go? Um, you know, how am I going to move the eye around this painting? It's really, really busy. Can I get away with it? And uh, so I really wanted a, a hard edge there. I, I softened it a little, but this was the perfect tool to mix my paint and go into it like that and pull away. And it'll give you an incredibly hard edge. Are they expensive? No. They are not expensive. They are middle to lower, and because they are the very first knockoff or imitator of rosemary ivory, Mike was kind enough to mark them forty percent off, as opposed to our standard thirty. So they're a very good value. Wow. Okay. How are we doing for time, folks? We have all day, right? Yeah, we're here all day. <laughs> you take as long. He's as not. <laughs> Is anybody going to paint this afternoon? Yeah. Yep. I think I may. Not sure yet. Depends on how much energy energy I expend. For me, this is really tiring. When I when I have a day of painting and when I'm in a festival, you paint, you sleep, you eat. You paint, you sleep, you eat. And by the time five days, six days is over, I need, you know, you need some time to relax. So it's pretty taxing for me. These people that can paint these bigger paintings and do three of them in a day and paint all day long, I just envy that energy because typically I'll just be shot after the first one. And then I just got to eat something and get up for the next one when I have to paint. There's nothing like painting when you have to paint. Like if I was to wait until I had the inspiration, I might paint five paintings a year. Sometimes I've got to force myself to go paint, which has been the hard truth lately. 
Well, not lately in the last six weeks, but prior to that, really had to do some forcing to go out and paint. It was it was tough. Okay, so anyways, uh, picking out the composition. You know, I, I like the way that looks. The tree, so I'm, I'm gonna really eye it up here. I determined that, you know, I wanna go with a square. I did a square already. I'm gonna go with a square again. And I'm gonna put my initial uh, marks down. So I always, I always use the uh, spirits when I'm gonna put the initial marks down. Okay, if this was a blue sky, which it is not, although it was the other day, the very top, I took this blue and I washed it all the way down to here while my panel was white. Because I wanted that blue underneath there, I wanted it to set up. There was no white involved in mixing that blue. The white was my panel. So that's a, about as clean of a blue as you can get up there, especially right there where I scumbled. And because I knew I wanted it in the water too, I just washed it all the way down to here. And then I went ahead and it's still pretty similar. There's ground underneath. You look down, there's ground. So I washed a brown color up to that line, fuzzed the edge a little bit, continued on from there. So this is not, and I'm telling you that because that painting's still wet. So I'm telling you that because I want to put my washes down. And if I'm going to, if I really want that clean blue, I've got to do that first. Because if I, if it mixes in with anything else, then it won't be that clean blue anymore. I'm not too worried about it up there now. When I'm drawing, putting in shapes, I like to use my ultramarine and my transparent oxide red. It's essentially blue and orange. So I can get a really warm gray. I can get a really cool gray. I could get a orange like a dirty orange color, or I can get a dirtier blue color. Now, it's good to know the characteristics of the paint you're using too, and that's something I'm always learning. But what I've learned, I switched the brand of the oxide red that I use because I learned that it's the same color number. I don't know what that's called, the same color number it's the exact same color according to the way they make it, except for it was a value darker. And I use these two colors for my darks especially. It'll make black. Um, but it will it makes a, a clean, vibrant kind of black, I think, where I can add some alizarin to it if I want it to be a redder black. Not necessarily warmer or cooler, but if I want to skew that way. And what I learned about this transparent oxide red, though, is that it's way stronger in tint, it's more staining than my blue. So, so what brand is the oxide? Holbein. Holbein. I used to use the Rembrandt. I, it's funny, I, I've got a lot of Rembrandt colors. I love their paint, but I really love their tubes. They're just so colorful and fun. You know, Winsor & Newton's white, you know, and you can't. So anyways, that's just a silly thing. So, okay, let me think about this over here. There are so many lines going through this way. You want to try, a general compositional rule is nothing straight there. You can do that if the, if the reason's right, okay? In this instance here, there's so many uh, stripes, let's just call them. You got, you got the sky, you got the hill, you got the water, you have the reeds, and you have the foreground. That's all, you know, all of them are horizontal lines. Now they're not all perfectly straight, the top of the um, the trees in the back there, they have this nice undulation. I'll go with what is there, but I'll try to adjust it a little bit. Um, so, and plus I'm going to layer over these trees. And for me, the trick was to take this fairly complicated scene and turn it into something interesting uh, that's, you know, not too overcomplicated. And honestly, I don't... I almost never know if it's going to work. I've done hundreds and hundreds of paintings, and you never know 
you know, you, I just never know if it's going to turn out. Do I have do I have enough energy to put into it? How do I feel that day? Are the bugs bothering me? Did the sun bother me on that last painting day where I couldn't set up where I was going to be the most comfortable? And I made mistakes because of that. And mistakes in my mind that, you know, I've already got a plan for that. So maybe it's an opportunity to learn for me. They say you never make mistakes. And I love happy accidents. I do have them all the time. <laughs> and I had one. Well, this isn't a happy accident. But I was setting this up, and it went boing. Oh. <laughs> okay, I, I, I learned that hard lesson with a painting. My painting was almost done, and it went boing, flip. You know, all my paint there. It didn't ruin the painting, but it sure could have. So me yapping on like that is equivalent to my hemming and hawing stage. Only you had to listen to it. <laughs> so <coughs> I really use this exclusively until I get my marks down. I painted it already. You would think I would know exactly what to do, where to put my marks. But I I don't. Like I know I want I know I want the base of that big tree right there. Maybe I want it over here, set. I love the idea of that there, that tree going there, this one here, it's going to be up that other one. And because I'm judging where these are in my plane, I know that the beginning of my reeds, so there's, there's one line where it's not splitting. It's not splitting the panel, but uh, you know that's going to be where the where the green stops. You know, and then perhaps the water starts there. Perhaps the distant hill starts there. Now, so when I'm painting on my own, I might measure a little bit, you know, just to get things exactly right. I'm not too worried about that here. I. I I would love to get to the point, I see, I know some artists that they don't really, they, they, they just paint, They're, they don't do this, they seem to know exactly where to put their stuff, their drawings are impeccable, and I hope someday I can get to where I don't have to plan as much and I could just say, well, I'm going to draw this out real quick, don't have to do this, don't have to measure, and there you have it. Well, for me, this is an important tool for me. So now I know where my marks are. I was going to show you about the, uh, the strength of my transparent oxide uh, red. So when I go and put a wash down, now what I want to do is I want to put a dark, warmer wash underneath my grass. Now let's just say I put a wash down that is too blue, which I'm doing on purpose. So that is really way too dark. And it's, it has Gamsol in it, and I uh, use these quite a bit. So, um, I don't wear gloves. Maybe I should. Uh, I recommend you wear gloves. I tried, but I can't, but I get paint all over my hands. And so I know right now that I'm not going to touch my lid. I mean, this isn't planter paint, and this is just trying to stay safe with your material. I won't touch my lid of that with my bare hand because sometimes I feel like I'm tasting something that's probably paint and I don't want to ingest it. So uh, once my hands are keep, you know, in battle, then these cannot go to my eyes. They cannot go to my mouth. And if they do, I've made a big mistake. So anyways, here's my ground. It's, there's enough on there and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do this from the side and not let it fall off. <laughs> Now that truly was mostly blue up there, but the orange is what's really sticking. Now if I go and put blue in there, I can make it blue. Well, let's just say that's a mistake and I want it to be warmer. My transparent oxide red really overpowers. Look at that. I mean, it almost took, it almost took that 
blue right away. And so now that orange is interacting with the white, and in my mind, it's giving me a nice, rich, darker color. So truly, I did that just to show you how that works. And uh, so another thing, so there I go. And that's cobalt, so I certainly don't want to eat that. Um, and, I, you know, and I got that from my first incident. So also when it's, and thank God that it's not really windy. When I first got here, this was blowing. So I either put this on this side, this is for all my debris, or on this side. And that depends on which way the wind blows. And if the wind's blowing where it wants to do that, <laughs> then I do this. Rock, and it's windy. If the wind's blowing and I'm worried about this, um, when I was doing pastels, I, I was painting a day, and I'm pretty sure you were there, at, here at Mendon Ponds, in the winter, walked away to socialize, I came back, and all my pastels were in the snow. I don't know how many I left there. I tried to get them all, but hard, hard lesson. So when it's windy, I won't walk away from this like this, and maybe I won't walk away at all. I uh, Part of my setup is I have a couple bungee straps. So my tackle box is kind of heavy, so I'll weight it down. They're here, Kevin. Here, there. So I'll, I'll just I'll weight it down to something. There are setups where people wear uh, backpacks, and then they'll there's a hook there, and they'll hang the backpack. All right. So I'm going to wash this all over the whole surface because it's a great day and i'm just going to do it and just kind of watch i'll try to move from side to side so you can see what i'm doing and bark out any questions if you have any kevin what colors do you have on your palette whoa okay i got titanium white this is richardson i don't know some kind of it was a free gift that i love Almost out, gonna buy more. Really yellow light. I love to use that in warm mixtures. I want to lighten up. And then I just have Windsor and Newton white. Alizarin crimson, cadmium red uh, light, cadmium orange, cadmium yellow deep, cadmium yellow. I used to use pale, but now I'm using light by whole. Uh, Old hollow. So then in the middle, so I, I try to go through the spectrum here, you know, red to blue with my uh, earth tones in the middle. So then the earth tones are going uh, Naples yellow, yellow ochre, terra rosa, transparent oxide, red, and viridian, cobalt teal, cobalt blue, King's blue that I don't use very much flat air painting. And French Ultramarine. I don't always use all those colors. Sometimes I don't use any of them at all. And all the blue I have in there or here, I use all the same, the same palette all the time. And I mix my colors with both of them all the time. I've already decided that, okay, look at the top of those trees over there. See that nice brightness that's on top of those trees? Mm -hmm. See that all the time. See it a lot in paintings, whether it's there or not. You probably might see it in mine. It may or may not have been there, but I'm deciding I want it there. I love it. So when I get up to the sky, I'm going to make sure that I have more of that up there than this. So as I'm washing this up there, that's what I'm thinking about.
So when I was here Thursday, this is exactly what I did, except for I took my blue to here, and then I brought that up to there. Same scene, different lighting, different effects. So because I want it to be brightest there, I'm wiping that first. Because as I go, it's going to get a little darker and, and muddier. I'm using less pressure because I want everything underneath it a little bit darker. This is the sky. I'm not worried if everything's exactly where it needs to be. What I find is the more exacting you are, beginning, middle, or end, and if you want a realistic look, the more precise you have to be. The vaguer you are, though, you can get away with almost anything. If you're, if you're vague, but it represents what you're looking at. So those are my initial marks I had. I'm just, so I got to be right in the middle. Is that okay? Well, the rules say no, but if I have so much going on there, is it going to distract? Is it going to be a matter? I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. If I think I have a compositional problem, I go to my people that I think are the best out there, and I search through their paintings until I find one that agrees with my thoughts. Smart <laughs> <Our> choice. <laughs> If you're looking for an answer and you ask enough people, they're going to give you the answer you want. <laughs> okay, now, as I did say, though, well, let me observe. So here's another thing. I didn't even touch on this, really. I really observe. Once I figure out what I'm going to paint, I really observe before I start doing anything because I want to I want to do my layering in the right order. So I'm going to stand here and, and I'm going to look at it for a little bit. I'm going to do this so that I could understand values and such. I also want to see which edges are meshing because you might have, you know, yellow and purple. They vibrate, you know, they're opposites. If you can get those values similar, and if they look similar, um, you know, and you want to see it, I find that if I squint, you know, I can determine that a little better. Yeah. Okay, so. So there's my wash. As it turns out for this painting here, if I came in with a toned panel that was already toned this color, it would have worked for me. I didn't know that, though. Okay, so now I handle it. And because I put this on so thin, this is going to be dry enough to be able to layer over it without it mixing into my paint unless I really get in there and turn a flat into a filter. Because scrubbing is what, what makes mud when you scrub at the end. Um, and it, what, it's what ruins my brushes. So now I'm drawing out the seam. I grabbed straight um, transparent oxide red on my brush. I went into my pile. I didn't add any more mineral spirits, but Gamsol, but there's some in here. So this is uh, where my reeds start. So I'm going to do one of these. This is Kevin Furry, and he is part of a collaboration of four art clubs, which I will talk about at the end of this video. Now, truthfully, when I look out there, I'm seeing, I'm not seeing this color out there. I'm really not. 
Um, to me, and I'm looking for the darks and the reeds. To me, I'm thinking a warmer purple, maybe. That's what I'm seeing. But I also think that there is going to be some brights in there like that. And whenever I could use my initial washes in the end of a painting, it just gives it a vibrancy. I think I started on a on a thought and I didn't finish it. So when I go to plenary paint, I try to make sure that when I'm done, I leave. There's very little evidence or any that I'm there. Most of the time it'll be, you know, where I was standing or in the snow, but I really try to make sure I'm not leaving any kind of debris along the way. So I'm really seeing the darkest here, here. I'm also seeing the dark there. So I think that gives us a nice progression. Thinking abstractly, you know, if I want to go from here to here and up. Okay, the problem with this right now for me is that, you know, I have this and that, but then this is wide open. But I know that at some point I'm going to put something here and I'm going to put something over there. So that, and, and when I do that, I try to make sure that this space doesn't equal this, doesn't equal that. As humans, we have this tendency of putting everything in perfect order. I consciously think, do not line things up. Make that space bigger. And I realize two hours later, I did it. And it's like, ah. <laughs> so, oh, that brings me to another tool. Sarah Linda Polly, did I say her name right? She needs credit because she taught me about the ivory brush in the first place, which these imitate. But I saw her use a rubber nib to move paint away. I love this thing as much as I love uh, my viewfinder. And what I could do is, after I have a ton of paint on there, let's say it's thick, let's say it's white in the sky, and I can't get marks to go through because it's blending in. I take this thing here and I just wipe it out. So it doesn't do it so well, you know, once it dries. But it works really well for any kind of thick paint. Now, so nervous brush stroke. I mentioned that earlier. I did a little bit of washing. That essentially is a wash. It's a gradated wash from blue to orange. And uh, so I want there to be some dark under a bush I've already planned I'm going to put there. I'll observe it. I'm observing it like this. Hardly, I'm trying to reduce the value. I'm trying to reduce the, uh, the con contrast so I could see where is it darker. And is there a beautiful abstract shape there? When I try to make things up, it's too mechanical. But if I if I mimic what I see out there, I'm not exactly painting it. I'm just looking for that abstract design always. And uh, and if I can suggest it like that, then it's typically more natural. So nervous brushstroke is. Now, I wasn't standing in front of it, so I wasn't really designing it, but that's the, the way I do it. I got a nice, when you come up and look when we're done, I got a nice variety of blues and oranges in there, and it's dark. So 
So underneath this big tree, there's some dark in there too. Okay, now I'm going to introduce a little bit of my um, alizarin crimson. I'm working into my same mess of paint here. I'm all about clean color. I love clean color. For me, clean color comes towards the end when I'm uh, mixing, not towards the end, throughout the whole. I'm not worried about these three colors mixing together because they're going to give me variations and it's not going to look like mud unlike what it would towards the end when I have thick paint. Um, I might have a clean blue in there, and if I take this brush and try to work in my clean blue, it's going to muddy it. So, you know, that's what I try to avoid. But for this stage, the same pile, the same brush is fine. I'm just going to adjust the color a little bit. Because, as I said, you know, I want, I, I see some purple in there. Now it's really dark. It's okay. Because I already know I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it in such a way so that it's not, so that we're going to have a variety. So that it's not, um, you know, all a solid color. And when I fuzz that around, I'm thinking about my edges. I've also decided that, you know, I'm going to use something similar but bluer back there for my distant trees. My alizarin crimson is pretty powerful too. So I gotta be careful with it. I'm designing this. So one of my original teachers was, uh, still is, I shouldn't say was, um, in the beginning of my adventures in art, I was Steve Carpenter, and uh, I never understood this, I understand it now though, like he would be painting away, doing stuff just like this, and he would say he's preparing it to paint. In my mind he was painting, but he was preparing it to paint. So what he was doing is he was trying to get it all set up with transparent colors so that he can lay colors over top of it. And so I'm almost done with that. So I also want to make sure I've got that, that three value thing going. And when I squint at it, Almost, it's almost there, but it's close enough. So these colors here, they're here and here. I'm just gonna, well first, normally what I do is look, and I say, yeah, some of it could go there. You know, we, we might be able to get away with a little bit of it there. You know, maybe even back here a little bit. Very, very little bit. I mean, our mind would tell us that that water should reflect that hill, but it's not. I think it's not because of the breeze.
So, so I'm going to work on these trees a little bit. And I want to try to make some marks that I'm not going to have to fiddle with later. Well, I don't know if you can see, but really light brush stroke over it. I'm, I'm layering over top of that. So this tree here isn't as dark as I'm painting it, but there is dark in there, so I want it underneath it. Essentially using this as a painting tool. It's chilly when you're just sitting around, but look at the sun. Mm -hmm. Sun's gonna come and it's gonna change that. Because <laughs> I've everything. talked too much. Yeah. And but okay, so do you see that brightness on those reeds? That's why my orange is there. I'm, you know, I'm hoping that this is gonna happen. But um, I'm not gonna paint a blue sky sunny day. It's just kind of peeking through. It's nowhere's over there, but it sure is. Lighting up this right here. Ryan. <laughs> this is Kevin so, Freary. Oh. Go ahead, Chris. This is Kevin Furry demonstrating for four art, art clubs. It's a collaboration between the four clubs. So I'm deciding really where I want this. I want it there. I don't want these faces to be the same. This is good. This, 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 and this is good. These are going to be dynamic. Now, the beauty of all this, too, is I'm being so loose and carefree with really what I'm doing. You know, what could have been a mistake or in the wrong spot isn't a huge job for me to move it now. I like this a lot too. So it, it'll take care of any of the uh, uh, thicker ridges I have up there. When I lay down dark colors, I want them to be thin. I want them to be transparent. The darkest darks, they're not always that way, but I want to start out that way and see you know, what it's like when, we, when, when I'm done. 
I also do this so that I can layer over it. And I, you know, if I'm careful about how thick I'm putting my paint on, I can get three, four different layers in the setting. Um, on a day like this, maybe only three, two, because it doesn't dry, tack up. It doesn't need to dry, just kind of tack up. And also, this is taking care of some of the edges for me. So now this is a little better with we've got to the lightest light, the next value, um, lightest light, next value, the next one after that's going to be maybe the lights in here, and then the ground in here. This is a little bit darker, but it's lighter than this. So my darks that are here are going to be lighter than that. This is, you know, this is my go-to dark. I've been judging off of this. And sometimes in the beginning, I'll put the lightest light somewhere just so I can do some judging on my value relationship. So another metric that I go by is if this bag is full at the end of a painting, I've had a tough day. <laughs> Right, so far there's no white anywhere in this at all. So what are we gonna do? And and that is a good question. I, I have a good idea of what I want it to look like. And now I'm trying to figure out what's the order, what should I do next? You know, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm never a hundred percent sure on that. You know, this tree's got branches coming off it, they all do. Um, I want to be able to layer some of that over top of the sky, but I do want to have like a bright spot, and I think I want it there. I want to exploit those orange leaves, even though it's not as lit up as my original painting. I can still make that happen without painting that painting again. So yeah, light up there, exploit the orange, take some of that fresh green the fresh clean green that's here so that I have this you know nice visual area. I mean it's not really not an accident that I left that brighter there in here, you know, and I just haven't worked on that yet. So I'm gonna move away some of my paint here. Because now I'm gonna start mixing some colors that I may or may not want to keep pure. So I'm going to rinse this out, but I'm, I'm not going to get it perfectly clean. I'm going to work on some green. So I'm squinting again. I'm going for my, uh, my ultramarine blue. I'm going to grab a little yellow ochre. So Kevin, when you're done with your washes, do you work from bottom to top, top to bottom, side to side, or just whatever your... I try to go from back to forward. Okay. Um, that's what this is so far anyways. Okay. And so, but now what I'm doing is I'm trying to put some color marks down. Ah, okay. Because I want some kind of harmony to be happening. And it's good to step back. We want to make sure that we're not tipped here, which I think we might be. I'm not terribly worried about that yet. So my mind is this is a little bit darker green. So I'm looking over there. Where is my darker green? And I, I'm seeing a bunch of them over here. I'm going to adjust it a little bit because I do not want my green to be the same everywhere.
So I anticipate as the sky begins to open up, it's going to lighten up here a little bit. But I would have to think that around these trees, it's going to be a, just a little bit uh, darker because of the shade of the tree. So I'm going to put some of that there. And I see it too. So now this is set up pretty good, whereas if I, I want to layer over it, like, you know, it's more there, but like that. So it's sitting on top of that. It's not mixing in. So that truly is some fresh spring type green. Um, we're, it's, we're starting to lose it, but I'm going to put a, a fairly chromatic color down just to see. I mean, it, at least it looks that way down here. So now I'm going to see what it looks like up here. And I want to see where am I going to put it. I'm okay with that. That green was what? How'd you mix that? Well, it's to get this vibrancy, I use the cadmium yellow white and mostly my ultramarine blue. But I did gray it a little bit with the, um, the yellow ochre, just a little bit. I, uh, I believe, you know, I added some of the Naples yellow light too. See right there, nervous brush stroke. I mean, you can barely even call that a brush stroke. But I'm not licking it. I'm not staying in one place and going like that. I can do that. Like if I want a spot where, let's just say, right here it does look, you know, pretty much the same. It's uh, there's some variations in the color. I've already got my ground, which is underneath it. So. What's going to happen if I take the same color I've been doing all this with? And what's going to happen? Now I'm looking at this shape. So I, what I see is a shape like that. To me, that's interesting. So now I'm just going to try to put it in quickly without losing everything that's underneath it. Every once in a while, it's good to look. <laughs> Ooh, oh, oh, oh. No! 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 And I'm going to introduce a color that I don't want to, you know, mix in with these colors. And it's the, the, the yellow skewed color that's out there. We're going to just, we're going to call the reeds a yellow color. But they're really a grayed out, earthy kind of ochre, sienna, all of that in there. So the first, but the first marks of this yellow I'm going to put down are going to be darker than the lightest ones that are going to be there. <laughs> so I never really know for sure, is it good enough? I got a mark down there. It looks great there, but what's it going to look like up here? So I'm going to get a little bit, and it's really dark. What colors are you making? It's not too dark. This is uh, yellow ochre in the transparent oxide red. It, it seems to be pretty vibrant. I like it because I want some of that. Now I want some of that right there.
There. I want to get a little bit into here. So that was a scrub. I'm applying it. Some of what's here is mixing into it, but I'm also allowing some of it to stay. So I'm still not making mud. I still don't have any white. I did use a little bit of Naples yellow white, which we could say has some white in it. Um, but in my mind, I'm hoping these are some finished marks I put in there. So we're still preparing it. And now what I want to do is I want to work this color into this color. I'm going to try to do this from the side. Really like pressure. So that little movement there was all about edges. I mean, there is so much going on just in those reeds, but there's not one single hard edge in the body of that. And if I want to represent what's there, I could use whatever colors I want, but you know, I need to make sure those edges are softer. So now I'm going to step back and I'm going to say, well, crooked. That's what I'm going to say. I love meshing edges with this in the beginning. But so when I made that, is it fun and relaxing joke? When I get a painting to a point where that's all I got to do is those kinds of things. To me, that is really relaxing, enjoyable. I mean, it's all enjoyable to me. Um, my mood is directly related to how I feel about my painting. <laughs> I don't know You're if anybody alone. can relate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I paint most Saturdays. And if I am unresolved and I have to you know, stop painting, Sometimes I have a hard time focusing on what the next task is that I have to do. So it's usually good for me to block out enough time to finish whatever it is I'm trying to do. All right, so now before I move on, this light's changing quickly, I'm going to add some white to this and just try it in a couple spots. Now remember, what we're talking about is that brightness in the sky, some light here, and I want it to travel, you know, I want it to travel that way. And so now the sun <laughs> is here. So sometimes I just stop and get that out. I'm not going to do it, but if I need, I mean, I have, there's so much open air light on there that it's, it's pretty light up to begin with. So look how bright that is now. And I mean, that's, that's still, uh, higher chroma color, but it's not as white as it could be. So what I found is that if I want to lighten something up, sometimes white's not the, the non-color or color, however you want to look at it, to go to. Sometimes it's a cleaner, lighter color in that family. Like for me, I grabbed, I grabbed some of my Naples yellow, which is warmer and lighter in value, and then Naples yellow light, to add to that instead of white to keep it warmer, but yet it's still, you know, a value or two darker maybe than if I really went bright with white in it. Like I'm going to do up here. So, and then it gets to a point where you really have to put paint on. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so then now, it's on there pretty roughly. So, 
I want it richer and less rich, same color, only I'm moving it into my paint. So as you can see, it's not as clean. I'm going to stand in front of it and do it now. Light pressure. Not to be confused with I'm licking it with my brush. And then I'm going to go bam. I'm just going to let that hang out for a minute. So now I'm going to put a sky color in, the brightest bright. I just want to see where we're at. So I'm going for my clean titanium white. And I'm going to use my cadmium yellow deep. So what I've learned is that the brightest values that I really want bright, if I use the most chroma color with the white, it gives me a cleaner bright color. And I want it to be warm. So now I'm going to do this just to show you as an example. I wouldn't do this if I was just painting by myself. So, you know, this is, this is not white still. But it's, uh, I'm going to continue to add white to it. And I'm going to use it up here. But uh, this is what I would get. That right there is a big fat lie that because when I touched it down, it was all white only right there. <laughs> so I'm going to get rid of it. See you in there, it's gone. But it's way brighter than everything else I put down there. But for me, I want it to be a little whiter. So I removed it because when I put that color down, it picked this up and it just made it too muddy for my liking. I put a little bit of it in the sky. I should probably put a little bit in the water. So it's getting a little bit of, of the underpainting into it. So I'm going to wipe it clean. Clean as I could get it without using scan saw or spirit.
So I'm working on my edge. I put the thick color next to this color here, and I'm just using one of these movements. I think the next thing I'm going to do is uh, work on this a little bit. So I'm going to add white to my mixtures now. First thing I'm going to do is take what I started out with and add some white and see what I get. So right now my palette is just gray. So I'm going to go back to my Ultramarine blue and my Elizabeth Crimson, add it to it. So I don't want it to be a, like a too, too strong of a purple. So I'm okay with it having some of that gray color in it. Raise it out a little bit. It needs to be lighter, but that's pretty darn purple. So as we look over there, I see I see green, but you know that that's not going to determine the distance, so you're going to blue purple it. Yeah. I could, I mean, I could make it green, and then I've got to, like, make sure that it's grayer green, bluer green than these here. But I've already decided, and I already know by that, the purple works back there. I'm loving purple these days, so I'm going for it. <laughs> it and color... Color is such a personal choice, but I need to make that uh, lighter. So now, and it isn't a bad thing if I get some of that yellow in the purple either, because because they're complements and it'll gray it a little bit. I still want a bluer. And so now I'm going to work it into that, too. So I don't want to fall into the trap of my brain saying it's got to be this, this equals this, that equals that. I want to make sure it just doesn't go exactly the same through there. So this would be about the time, you know, my last trip for painting, I was painting. I wasn't quite this far yet, and I, we thought the place was closed, but it wasn't. And some uh, a school brought their kids there for a field trip, and uh, kids are watching. I love it. I love to talk when I'm painting and say what I'm doing and all that stuff. And the one kid goes, "What are you painting?" And I said, "This is over there. I'm painting that, that, and that, that." And he's like, "Well, it doesn't look like it." <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of where I'm at now. And so when I look over there, the one thing that I do notice is there is some dark darkness underneath there. But then there's also some land and it's a little light there. That's a detail I'm going to ignore. Because my light's going to be here. And at the end, if I want to put it in, I will.
So I put a little bit of dark on the bottom of it, but it's still way lighter than my darkest dark, so it has that progression. Can I take a picture of it? Let me send it to you. That'd be great. Thank you. So this edge is too strong. So I kind of do that kind of thing. So now we've got to get something else. We've got to get something else here and something else here. So this is painting in general, but plein air painting is solving the problem. Not that it's a problem, but the, the reason why I desperately try to not have a plan, I've already painted this, is so that you can see me try to work through these problems. And so what I want to do now is put some sky color in here over top of that and sky color here just to get a read of what's going on. And that typically would be the uh, like halfway through stage where maybe I could start adding some detail and stuff. So my time is almost up. We'll give you all you want. <laughs> I'm still putting it on. I'm not applying huge globs, even though I'm using thick paint. I've never seen you paint in such chromatic color. This is the new me. The new you. Okay. The whole idea is that as I continue to paint, the areas I want to gray out is easier to gray out than if I got an area I want to pump the color up in. Yeah. It's just always easier to go in that direction for me. It's always easier to make mud. <laughs> Who's playing chromatic? Uh, chromatic is the uh, the intensity of the color. So you can have a really uh, intense color like that yellow, or the yellow ochre there is less intense. It's still yellow, but one's richer in, in the color. Gotta be a Chris Kolupski student. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> took class with Chris for two and a half years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Value you and Chroma. Value you and Chroma. Value you and Chroma. <laughs> So I'm, I have white in my mixture here, but I still need it to be, uh, you know, not too thick so that I can layer stuff over it. Well, there's some horses.
So I'm just going frantic now because I know I'm running out of time. It's coming. Nice. So like I said, I'm a slow painter. I'm not done. And I'm a slow painter, and uh, typically when I do something as big, and if I don't have two and a half to three hours, I can't really finish a painting. But my goal is to show you some of the techniques that I use, some of the reasons why I do what I'm doing. So in that respect, I think I've done that. Um, but maybe what I'll do is I'll pick an area, and I kind of have been selecting areas to work on. So this is, this tree, I'm talking about the light coming through. You know, I wanted to exploit the orange there, but this tree is a pretty big player in this whole game. So when I look at this tree, they all of these trees relate. You know, I see some really dark brown in the dark. But I also see a greenish type color. And I find that um, I use my viridian and some of the transparent oxide uh, red and white. And then sometimes I'll grab some of the one of the yellows to adjust the green so it, so the green doesn't compete with this green. It'd be pretty tough for anything to compete with that because that's it's, it's pretty rich. So I just mixed up a little bit. It's pretty bright. And I think it might be too bright. But I just want to put a piece down so you can see. So like I'll go like right here. And the reason why I'm doing it there is so I can judge it with that. Because it needs to be darker than that. And it's a little bit darker, but not enough. And I'm really looking to get some bark effect here. That would be one of my heckling friends would start barking in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. But... And I've had four cups of coffee, so I shake more. I'm pretty steady. Very steady. But when I'm going just to touch it, just... And one of my heroes is Mark Boges, and he uses a mall stick. I love his paintings. But I was watching his demo, and it's like, well, if he can paint that with a little bit of shake, then I'm all right, too. As I'm doing this, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to get some interesting edges, too. So now I, I have a mess of color down there, but then, you know, I can go through and uh, organize the mess a little bit, let's just say. So now instead of wasting time, I've got 
you know, very specific colored brushes. I want to go back to dark. So I'm just going to get a fresh brush. So, I thought I would try some of this color and put it there, but when I picked it up, it's too close to that value. So I'm going to take my eraser, which is my nib, wipeout tool. And I'm going to put a different color over it. I didn't get it all off, but what's important is I'm not going to just try to change that thick color. Got rid of it. Now I'm going to try something else. <laughs> and when you get knocked down, just get back up. Try it again. So I think it's Sargent that would paint something. It probably was beautiful, but it wasn't what he wanted. And he'd just scrape it right down and maybe spend a whole day with that. Didn't like it, would scrape it down and go back to it. And if, you know, these heroes of mine of the past did it, then I think it's okay for us too. It's starting. When I stepped back, this was really bright. This is still really bright, but I already know I can kill it. It's not where I want the brightest bright. All right, so I need to design a few of these branches coming off of this tree right here. I really love, well, first of all, let's shore up the shape of it. For some reason, see, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I don't want it to be as blue. This is blue, okay with it, but this is too blue. I didn't get rid of all of it because a little bit's okay. That's better. So let's, uh, let's take care of that edge move. I used the back of this. I just went along and it was mixing in this thick color with the colors out there to, uh, you know, give me a softer edge. Now I'm, because my paint is thinner, it's been sitting there for a little while, I was able to put a dark color right over that and it didn't mix in. I won't be as successful trying to go over that. And if I want to do that, that's where I will take this and carve out my space first. The, the issue I have with this is it's so exacting and hard to control that sometimes I contrive it too much and then that natural feeling is gone. And so there is there is one right that we're gonna bring through. And then this one's gonna be a little higher. It's gonna come like that. There's some here, you know, there's one there. 
So that's really all I have to do now just to get it set up. So now I'm pressing, <clears throat> I'm pressing lightly as I do this. You want to bring some of the branches out. Maybe not too many. I, I may have done too many in my other painting. <clears throat> okay, I, I think my time might be out. You've exceeded your time, but we so enjoyed it. You can end so, whenever you like, Kev. Yeah, I do want to do just a couple things. Oh, go ahead. Is that okay? Oh, okay. yeah, all you want. We'll sit here. <laughs> I know. We'll sit here all afternoon. So, <laughs> so my caveat for doing this was that I wouldn't finish the painting. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just starting to get past, you know, its roughness. Where I can start to hone in on some stuff. Seriously, I'd need to paint a couple more hours working on this. But I want to put in the vision that I had in the first place. So, so as you said, you know, more light here, coming down to here. And I'm going to try to do this in 25 brush strokes or less, and then I'm done. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to talk, but I just said this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to try to do. I don't want that, right? Well, maybe I want a streak of it down there. I didn't mean to do that, but I'm going to work it. You are watching Kevin Freire.
put some final touches on his painting. This plein air event has been the collaboration between four groups for our clubs in the Rochester area. We will announce those at the end. We want to thank Rochester Art Club for supporting, or Rochester Art Supply for supporting this event. So I'm blocking the sun that's hitting my palate so I can judge it a little better. And there is a nice pattern of light going on over there now from the sun. So oftentimes I'll put thick color down like that when I want to get grasses or, or uh, like reeds or things like that, I'll do this move over it. And I'm going to do that right now. Have you named that move, that move? <laughs> <laughs> Make this color bright enough, it'll sit on top of this here, and you'll still be able to see it. So this is this has got yellow in it a lot more. Yeah, that's kind of dumb. So it has more yellow in it, at least it should, which means it'll it'll read on top of this green here. And that back there. And what I want is I want a spot of it, like right here. So there are times that this could take me a while to do. So I've got my color I think I want, and I, I just need to lightly touch it. It may or may not work. Okay, that was 22 brush strokes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Kevin. So I'm done, but uh, I am going to put some of this orange down after we disperse. I could do this for another too long. This is the OCD part, right? Oh yeah, I'm not leaving here until I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I 
looks great. Appreciate your time, Kevin. I just want to take a minute real quickly. Thank you for coming. I mean, you knew it was going to be cold when you still came. But uh, this is the first time it's been a collaborative plein air event. We're all clubs got together. So this would not have happened if the presidents from all the clubs and their board didn't agree to support them. So I just want to thank all the clubs for helping this happen. And Chris for helping me make this happen as well. Good job, Chris. The other presenters, <laughs> Drew and Colette. If you did enjoy it, that's great. We'd like to do something like this again, maybe on a better day. <laughs> and and uh, I know some of you wanted to see more than just one of the demonstrations. So maybe next time we'll tell one after the other. We'll see how that goes. We were hoping everybody would just see a demo and go out and paint. But this is what happened. Yeah. I also want to appreciate uh, say thank you to my wife. She's been videotaping as well. She's our newsletter editor. So again, thank you, and uh, hope you enjoyed both of us.